Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight we have an all male panel that we have put together for the Speak Up and Inspire series that is made up of some very prominent community leaders in our community from not just Charlotte, North Carolina, but also the Raleigh, Durham area as well. We are going to be talking to several men tonight about racism and social injustice. So what I would like to do to get us started is to have everybody introduce themselves. And I would like to go ahead and start off with um, Commissioner Mark Jarrell. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what do you do in the community? Sure, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, first off, I wanna say thank you for having me and uh, greetings to everyone. My name is Mark Jarrell. Uh, I serve on the Board of County Commissioners here in Mecklenburg County aka Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, I've been involved in the community for a really long time. I'm in my uh, first term, uh, second year, and uh, prior to that, did a lot around voter education, um, campaign management, and just really civic engagement in our community, and I'm uh, happy to be here with this distinguished panel of brothers this evening. Looking forward to a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, can we have Mr. Dwayne? Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is C. Dwayne here. I am author of The Ripple Effect, The Lasting Effects of Domestic Violence. And I normally advocate for domestic violence um, and homelessness and, and mental health. Um, I live in the Durham area and that's me. I, uh, I advocate. Thank you, thank you. Mr. James Thompson. Oh man, how you doing? First of all, Tiffany, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel. Um, James J.T. Thompson, co-founder of Big Boo Radio, host of the Elite Life Show on the TNE Network, and also the president of the Elite Gents organization um, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, definitely um, looking forward to the conversation tonight and um, linking and talking with these brothers. Thank you so much. Mr. Darrell Petway, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Darrell. I'm the club director of Raleigh Boys Club, which is part of Wake County Boys and Girls Club. Uh, seven units are in Wake County. Um, been with, with the organization for 10 years. I have first started out with Zebulon Boys and Girls Club, which is the eastern part of Wake County, and then moved up to um, the Raleigh Boys Club director, and so I serve a all boys unit, which is majority African American, and as <laughs> some people say, low risk kids. But in my opinion, they're just kids. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Cedric Sanders. Hey, everybody. Um, how y'all doing? It's good to see you, uh, you gentlemen on here. I'm definitely looking forward to this. This is something that me and Tiffany have been talking about for quite a while now. Um, and we've, uh, through Butterfly Visions, through Speak Up and Inspire, we've done several uh, panels that were majority women, but we have yet to do an all male panel. And, and, and there's, there's several topics that people are, are wanting to hear from us as the brothers, as the men, um, and, and representing black culture um so uh, i know we got some stuff in the works for domestic violence uh down the road but um you know with what's going on right now i felt like you know no better time than to get all of us together to have that conversation that we need to have um i am a freelance graphic designer uh out here in the charlotte concord canapolis area and uh, i also um what's the best way to say it? uh i organize uh a group for the community called family which is friends that are like family you know and i used to play on words and uh for the last five years i've been hosting a, a bingo event at a, a local nursing home in south charlotte um i usually do about four four of them a year like every other month or so something like that and, uh, you know, we just get uh, bags together for the residents and um, play a nice little game of bingo, a couple games of bingo, actually. 
And uh, it's just something nice for them because they don't get visitors and stuff like that. So i um, looking to do a lot more in the community, uh, partnering with my wife, Tiffany, uh, on uh, domestic violence and sexual assault, and also want to touch on, uh, on homelessness as well. So um, again, I'm thankful to be here and I'm glad that, uh, to, to see all you gentlemen here. Yeah, it's nice to, to actually see y'all, you know, instead of, you know, just putting the pictures on the flyer. <laughs> thank you thank you mr brandon please introduce yourself what's up with you you know what it is man it's mr excitement brandon chuck brown founder of the single save the serious movement started in 2015 due to a failed uh marriage and a heartbreak after the marriage and um started having panel discussions i have two documentaries out um a singles documentary of singles being single saved and serious and a married uh documentary of the transition from being single saved and serious to married so um amongst various other things uh entrepreneur um own transportation company i host events um you know and and just show love to the community so um manage gospel artists uh, so so much stuff that I'm doing based off the single save the serious movement. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. J. Locke, please introduce yourself. Peace, peace. How you doing? Um, J. Locke, songwriter, artist, owner of Alpha Men's Care, um, activist. Um, I also do a lot of things in the community outside of activism as well. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So guys, um, the main reason why we decided to have this panel tonight is one, we thought that, well, we feel that it is very important for men to be active and um, in the community, especially with our children, especially with the times that we're living in right now with the, um, the racism and the social injustice that is just increasing every single day. Um, but then also we wanted to put a panel together about domestic violence and how men can join the advocacy um, uh, advocacy community um, to help with reducing domestic violence. And so that's how this panel was born. So I'm looking forward to this panel and many more with you to talk about a lot of the issues that are going on in the community. But tonight we're gonna be talking about racism and we're going to be talking about social injustice and more specifically about how these issues are affecting our families and our children. So I do believe that everybody on here is a father, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Correct. Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. So my first question to you as fathers is, have you ever personally dealt with racism? And if you can give us um, an example of something that stands out in your head when it comes to racism and your personal dealings or your personal experience with racism and um, how you're feeling about the state of the world right now. So we can start off um, if anybody wants to start, yeah. Start with Darrell, because I know he's on the time crunch. That's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Darrell, especially with you working with children every single day. Um, great. That's good. So can we start off with you? Have you ever had a personal um, experience with racism? If you can share that briefly with us and then tell us what, what are your feelings right now about the state of the world? Um, okay. So I, I have two. I, there's two ways I can answer that question. Um, I've had a professional way that has happened many times. Um, and then I've had personal experiences. So um, the top one, because I don't want to hold y'all up too much. Uh, personal experiences, uh, I, I, I think the most would be high school. I still remember I was playing basketball, actually, at Optimus Park. Um, just regular game. And I, I did hang out with, uh, I was a very diverse person. So I did hang out with all races. At that time, I was hanging out with um, a couple of my friends, and three of them were white, and one of them was a close friend to me. 
And when we came out to the parking lot after winning a couple of basketball games, somebody did, you know, say something out of character um, and actually said something out of character, not to me. Um, it was just, you know, bullying. So they were calling that person fat or whatever. And um, anyone that knows me, if you're close to me, I, I can snap at the drop of a dime. So I got real upset. And um, believe it or not, I just started beating on that person, unfortunately. Um, my friends pulled me back and said, don't do it or whatever. And I literally drove back up there just to handle that. Um, and, and it wasn't me personally. Um, I've been called an N-word personally and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know why it's never really bothered me. Um, maybe because I've hung out with a lot of diverse um and I've always tried to attack people, even at a young age. I don't know if it was my parents or what, but I've always tried to attack people in like a, a discreet, smart way. I don't know why, but I've, I've just always done that. Um, professionally, one thing that has really hurt me, and this is probably even personally, whatever, the worst thing that's ever happened to me um, that kind of really humbled me. Um, I work for the Boys and Girls Club, obviously, as you know, and uh, you guys all probably worked with Angel Tree before. Uh, I'm not gonna call out the store or the mall um, just because of my job, um, but we always have our tree. Um, at the time that this happened, I have already been working for the organization for seven years. So I, I, I'm pretty well known within the area of White County at the time, in my opinion. Um, but I definitely learned that I wasn't. So I had been going to this store for a month um, asking for the gifts. And I said, hey, are the gifts ready? Are the gifts ready? Are the gifts ready? Um, I even went there after church dressed up. Um, and uh, they always just said, you know, they weren't ready. And the sad part about it is I was oblivious to it. I, I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't even think about racism, right? I, I was more in work mode. I was stressed out. I was like, it's a week before Christmas. I got 250 boys that I have to get presents for, right? I got to get these. I have these names of 250. I have a membership of close to 1,000, but I have to get these 250. And it's a week before Christmas. So now I'm stressed, right? So I'm calling my job, my, my administrative staff, and I'm saying, hey, I, I have no gifts, like, I need the credit card. I need to, I need to make this happen. Um, and lucky enough, I knew someone that worked in administrative office and I get an email. And unfortunately that store didn't want to give me the gifts. Um, they actually had emailed back when they had asked, you know, we were a little concerned. There's no gifts. We're just checking up. They had said, yeah, there's been this guy that's been stopping by, but we haven't, we, we feel a little worried about giving him um, the gifts. Uh, it really tore me up because now I'm hot, right? Um, not to use uh, foul language, but now I'm like, I'm about to act like a nigga, right? Like I'm really upset. Like I'm, you know, I'm really upset. And um, I had to like really talk to myself and um, I, I go to my boss. And, uh, you know, at that time, I don't want to release any names. It was just more of like, you know, I just hate ignorant people, Darrell. And uh, my board member actually owned the property of this mall. So I was told, which I had to accept, that the board member has been contacted. It's going to be handled, Darrell. Don't worry. So I trust, I trust my organization because I love my organization, right? And um, it uh, it really hurt, and it still hurts till this day, even talking about it. But he 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 tells me, you know, it was handled, and they had a full closet. The whole back room was full of gifts. Like I had four days to pass out, almost close to two hundred gifts. Um. And bigger picture, right? I had to focus on that, right? You know, you got to put your feelings to the side. So you have to focus on that. And it really, 
it really got to me because all the store did was give me a, a apology letter and uh, <laughs> a box of chocolates. And that's not a joke. Like this is a true story. And um, the thing that hurt me even more, and I didn't even tell my boss because I really do focus on the kids. I always have been focused on the kids. After that incident, which really still gets me thinking about it, the policies changed of Angel Tree, right? So like, we don't, we don't work with that store anymore, but now it's make sure you wear your shirt, make sure you bring your ID, right? When really, I, I mean, I, I always wear, anyone that, anyone in Wake County has been to the boys club knows I'm the, I'm the different guy, right? Because I like doing that. I always wear my shirt. I always tuck in my shirt. Not because I'm trying to, it's just, it's just how my dad raised me. Like, that's how he was, right? So I'm going to do what my boss says. If dress code is tuck your shirt in, I'm going to respect authority. So I'm like, I always wore my shirt. I always had my ID on me. I even came at the church one time. I, I don't know. So like, I, that's one thing. And you know, I still have to go to this mall every year to still pick up gifts. We just don't go to that store. Mm-hmm. Right. And I really don't know what the conversation was with the board member. Right. Like it could have been, he probably didn't wear a shirt. Let's just put the policy in. Right. You don't know what the conversation was. Right. Anyone that's flying 50,000 feet, you know, they understand what I'm talking about. And so, like, I understand that, too, because of the way I've moved up that, you know, I know what that conversation could have been in that room. It could have been if he would have worn his shirt, it would have been all right. Or if he would have brought his idea, if he would have communicated better, this wouldn't have happened. This is just something that kind of bowled over. But I, I wore my shirt every time. I just I just wanted to pick up the gifts. So I think that's the worst experience I've ever felt. So right now, this is Juneteenth, and um, this is a perfect day for us to be talking about what is your, how are you feeling right now in the state of the world right now? Okay, so I have not watched any of the videos. Um, And, you know, people can judge me on however they want with that. But I I get sensitive about stuff like I've never watched any of the videos. Um, And I'm and me personally, I work in stuff in pockets, right? I work in sections of stuff. So me personally, I'm I I hate to say it, but I'm not really worried about June the day. I'm worried about how I can shift make, right? So like within my organization, I know that I need diversity on the board. I know within other organizations, they need diversity on the board, right? Like you can't lead the minority with the majority, right? Like that's just, uh, you gotta, it's gotta be a little bit more diverse. So um, me personally, that's the kind of, that that has been my goal. Like, yeah, you know, that, that's that's just been my goal as far as what I'm trying to do. I feel like every day is today. So I'm glad people are celebrating. I'm glad people are excited. But with my fraternity and everything, you know, that this has always been stated. This is something you have to know about. I don't think it's a day that we have to start partying or anything like that. It's just, you know, this is an everyday fight. And we, we, we have a lot of work. We have a lot of work to do. We definitely do. Definitely do. Thank you for sharing um, your personal and your professional experience. I really appreciate that. And you're right. We do need to have diversity in organizations that are leading the minority. I definitely agree with that. Definitely. Um, Mr. Mark, would you like to share an experience about um, an experience of yours that you maybe had to deal with racism? Yeah, Tiffany, thank you again for having me. Uh, So I'd say a couple of things. One, um, we experience as as black people we experience racism on a daily basis um a lot of it is is um covert it's institutionalized and it's systemic and so every day as we navigate this world and this system we are experiencing racism whether you're talking about um entering into a store any sort of institution if you're trying to get a loan somebody on here said that they were a business owner they are experiencing obstacles that are built on race 
and have advantaged other people based off of racism. So as you're looking at this, um, we're all experiencing this. I mean, we, I can give you experiences even as a um, county commissioner and, you know, a title um, that uh, does not uh, inoculate me from experiencing and navigating this world and this system. Uh, I go into rooms and, and feel like my voice is not being heard. Um, that is one of a, a, a real uh, issue, I think, for us as Black people. Uh, we are in rooms where we have to wait for people to validate what we're saying or to co-sign behind what we're saying. People think, you know, sometimes you look around the room and, uh, you know, you're like, hey, am I speaking a different language? Uh, somebody will come right behind you and say the same thing you just said and everybody agrees with it, right? And somebody else doesn't look like you. So these are things that we experience. I would tell Brother Durrell one interesting thing that he said as well, Tiffany, and I'll, and I'll uh, be quiet. Um, he mentioned something in, in, we are walking trauma units. We are navigating this space. We have decided that we are going to, you know, we, we are walking this space traumatized on a daily basis. It's something that we're born into and it's something we haven't corrected. And so brother Darrell was telling us a story and he even said during this story, he said, I get emotional talking about it now because we have not been able to deal with the trauma that we've experienced as we've navigated life. You know, we're born into this culture, we're born into this system, we're born into this institution that is designed for every outcome for it to be a barrier for us, to be a hurdle. It's not something that's easy. So everyone on here, I'm so proud to be on here with these accomplished men and, and, and of course you as a sister, but it hasn't been easy for anybody on this panel. And while if your skin was a different color in this society, everybody sitting here would be a multimillionaire easily, right? <laughs> but the system's not designed for us like in that sense. And so I just wanted to tell Brother Darrell, um, you know, we have to deal with our mental health and that stress and that trauma so that when you do tell that story, that it is not, a, a, you're not reliving a traumatic experience. And so I just encourage all of us as Black people, but particularly as brothers, to please go ahead and, and look into mental health and taking care of ourselves, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, the, the whole component. Yes. Um, thank you so much for that. That is a, a very um, big thing. Um, I am actually working on my master's now to become a licensed mental health counselor. And so I am a very big proponent of mental health. And um, yes, there's a lot of people that are still traumatized from the racism that they have um, experienced among other things that life pushes at us. Um, so that is definitely a good point. And I also appreciated the point of you saying that even though you are a commissioner, you still have experienced um, racism, that that does not exempt you from experience racism. So I really appreciate you um, sharing that with us. That, that's a very important point. And that's one reason why we invited you because we, we need to hear different views, viewpoints. And so I really appreciate you sharing that part. Mr. Um, JT, can you please share an experience with us that you've personally experienced? Yeah, um, I'll be brief. Um, it was the summer of 1987. I was sixth grade safety patrol. I was patrolling the block furthest away from the school by myself. And immediately that afternoon, um, a car um, sped down, um, down, past, down the street past me and out the window came a carton of eggs all over my clothes, safety patrol stuff. Um, it was three, three white boys, high schoolers. Um, and at that moment, it was the first time that I ever experienced racism slash my, my, the first time that I developed my faith. Because I understand now that Jesus was a, a offensive protection around me because there are several things that could have happened to me in that moment on that block by myself. But God had me, even though I endured the moment, it was a moment of awakening and an understanding that this is something that uh, I had heard about but didn't know personally what it was. So, um, you know, 
I handled it on my own, but I know God was with me the whole way because um, he guided me through that moment. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't really understand the moment, um, but I overstand it now. Um, and so when I think back to that, that moment was instilled and that moment happened so I can pour it back into my boys and I can pour it back into the youth that I deal with and, you know, on the platforms that I'm on, uh, you know, you may not know when and where, but at some point in your life, you're going to deal with some form of racism. And that was the beginning for me. Mm. Wow. Um, I'm sure that was probably a scary experience for you, especially not understanding the reason at that moment of why that happened to you. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And um, you have a very strong faith. Um, I've known you long enough to know that your faith is very strong. And so I'm glad that that is um, what, has, what has got you through that situation and continues to get through um, so many things that you have experienced in your life. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. No. Not a problem. Mr. Dwayne, can you please share one of your experiences with us? Sure. Um, I am from... And it's probably in a little bit of dispute, but I I believe so. I'm probably I was probably I'm probably from one of the most racist counties in North Carolina. It's called Johnston County. Mm -hmm. um, it is a mm -hmm. very uh, it's a very it's a, it's a large county. So because it has so many small little towns, in it. it's a very um, rural area. Um, one of my experience one of my experiences is living there is that. There used to be a sign in one of the one of their towns. I think it was either Smithfield or Selma, and the sign said, "Speed limit fifty five for forty five for niggas." Oh, I believe that and, was Selma. I'm because I, I I'm a, I originated from there too. My dad's side of the family. I think that's Selma. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, so um, I'm from Kenley in Johnston County. Now in Kenley, there used to be a skating rink. But as long as I've been born, the skating ring has always been private. It's been a members only. That was their excuse. Right. But the members never looked like me or had any um, complexion like me. Um, in this, in my small town, I probably say once I started driving, when I started driving, went to college, came back. And I, I didn't realize this. A lot of people don't realize this, that every interaction that you have with a police officer is re recorded. It's not on your driver's license, but it's a record for them to see. I was pulled over for what the police officer said was turning, turning left too fast. Turning left too fast. Um, I probably say for about a three month period, I was continuously stopped. I was stopped for, I didn't even know this was even possible. I was stopped for a license plate light being out. Didn't even know I even had a license plate light. You know why I didn't know I didn't have a license plate light? Because it was never on. Mm. So for about a three month period, I was continuously, you know, stopped for other stuff, um, simple stuff. And, you know, even though my interaction was recorded, I still would end up getting a ticket, a citation. Uh, uh, no left turn signal. Um, like I said, turning left too fast. License plate light. It will always be something simple like that. Going five miles over the speed limit. Mm. Wow. For I mean, growing up in that county, that being from there, did you know that you were living in one of the most racist? counties in North Carolina or did you discover that later on in life? Oh no, no. I knew that from, yeah. from elementary on. I knew that from elementary on. Um, yeah. Like I said, it was a very rural place. Yeah. Um, I knew that every time they come by for the summer, it wasn't summer, you know, basketball camps. Our summer camp was that we wouldn't pick, um, whatchamacallit, tobacco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. Yeah, I even had one of the ladies that's a, uh, that's that uh, is a teacher in my town. Um, she was a teacher in my town. She used to tell me because she lived in a big house. She was, she was living in a big house. She said, you should come clean my house for the summer. Hmm. Wow. And my wow. last name, and this is, this is another funny thing too. My last name 
my last name, which is Hennett, is a uh, is a wine um, dis distillery that's there. That wine distiller used to be a plantation. Mm. Wow. Wow, that's deep. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Um, Mr. Cedric, can you share an experience with us? Um, yeah, I got a, a small one and a big one. Um, so I grew up in, uh, in Raleigh and uh, in a single parent household. So uh, with my mom, my brother, my sister. And, um, and I, I got to shout out to her. Uh, sometimes I feel bad because we do these panels and stuff, and she find out stories and information about stuff that happened. And, you know, <laughs> we close. So, like, she be, you know, I'll get a call later, like, man, you ain't tell me about that. Man, I'm going to have to, uh, you know. So, uh, if, mama, if you're watching, you know, uh, I'm sorry. You know, we'll talk about it later. But, um, yeah, so in high school, so, um, I was a, a artist, um, so I was really good at drawing. And the school that I was zoned to was uh, Wake Forest Roseville High. Now, um, if you grew up in that area, you knew, and I, I hate to say it this way, but that was the black school. That was the hood school. Uh, all, all the, all the hood, you know, some people went there. Okay, so they had built a school called Wakefield High School. And it was kind of on the borderline city limits. So when they rezoned, some of the kids from Wake Forest Roseville was zoned for Wakefield. Now, Wakefield was in this nice, rich, mostly white people neighborhood. Um, you know, uh, I guess the best way to put it, um, if y'all remember when Petey Pablo came out, put North Carolina on the map with his song and stuff, he lived in the Wakefield neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? So it was like that. People had helicopter pads and all that stuff. Um, so I wanted to go to this school. And it wasn't nothing wrong with Wake Forest Roseville High School. And it wasn't that I was trying to be better than, you know, the rest of my, you know, fellow hood people or whatever, you know what I'm saying, you want to call it, whatever. Of course, I got treated that way. And I know we definitely want to get into that later about the uh, uh, what me and uh, Dwayne was talking about with the colorism. Uh, in our own culture but um, long story short I went through a process signing paperwork to transfer to Wakefield and it's a predominantly white school and so when I got there you know it was really hard for me to get into the art classes and I don't know if it's necessarily it was a racism type of thing but when I got there I created the mascot for the high school and, and that's huge, that's huge. It's a brand new high school. And, uh, and we made it uh, into a really big sign and it got put on the gym wall. I signed my name as big as I could on the paw of it, it was a Wolverine. And I remember that a lot of the upperclassmen, I'm a freshman at this point, a lot of the upperclassmen, uh, uh, I hear them talking in the hallways and it's just like, oh, you know, like who did that? And so, you know, they made an announcement, you know, Cedric Sanders, you know, did that. And so, you know, I can hear them talking, you know, oh, you know, uh, there's no way, uh, there's no way a nigga could have did that or whatever. It's too good, you know, uh, this and that, whatever. We don't even have that many of them here. Most of them play sports or whatever. And and um, and it, it kind of hurt. I ain't even gonna lie, it kind of hurt a little bit. Um, but uh, it, it, I had, I, at that point, I really felt like I needed to prove a lot of them wrong. You know, so, you know, talent is talent. It doesn't matter what color you are. And I was raised in a household where we don't see color, you know, but we're not ignorant to it neither. It's not like we don't know what's going on or whatever. My mom raised me to be a smart man. So, you know, it's not that we don't see what's going on or whatever. You just got to be smart about what's going on. So um, I ended up joining the, um, the newspaper class. And so I had somebody in there write an article about the mascot and made sure that they put my picture in there. And I got my picture right in front of my work. So you know, this nigga did that, you know, and I hate that, you know what I'm saying? But we, like, it's called hashtag right. real talk. So I feel real like talk. I can talk to you gentlemen or whatever, straight like that. And you know what I'm saying? But it was like, I had a point to prove at that point, you know, like you're not about to just, just hold me down like that or whatever because of the color of my skin. I can do the same stuff as you can. 
I graduated from that high school with a 3.9 honors, Spanish honors, national achievers honors. So don't tell me that I can't do it because of the color of my skin. You know what I'm saying? But um, the other one, and I, and I, like I said, this is gonna spur something off later on in the discussion. But, um, and this is the one that my mama gonna get mad about. But in high school, um, I wasn't, I ain't gonna lie, I was into the, to the interracial dating. And my mom warned me early. Um, and she didn't want me to necessarily not do it. You know what I'm saying? So she let me know that's not something that she would do, but she let me know, do my research, make sure I'm aware, you know what I'm saying, of what's going on. Make sure that the person that I'm talking to or trying to date or whatever the case may be, understands that they are dating a black man and what that means. And, um, you know, of course, you know, in high school, you know, I'm not really thinking about that, you know what I'm saying? It's the lust and all of that stuff, whatever. So um, it's just a young uh, uh, white girl. And, um, you know, we was, it, I don't even know if it was really serious, but, you know, we see each other, we link up and hang out and stuff like that. And, um, you know, my family had no problems with her or whatever. You know, I didn't tell them a whole lot, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like that serious to me bring you on the mama type of thing. But I always wonder why she never talked about her family. Never, you know, I never spoke to her family, never went to her family and stuff like that. And so um, we had a one date. I had to go and pick her up from the house. And um, long story short, her, uh, her dad wasn't with it. He wasn't with it. And uh, he pulled a gun. And he disowned her. He called her a nigga lover, his own daughter. And he disowned her. Now, I'm glad that I was able to get out of that situation safely. And I ain't gonna lie, man, I ran home to my mama crying. And uh, she don't, I mean, it's, it's been so long ago, so I know she don't really remember this. But like I said, we had a long conversation about if I'm gonna date outside of my race, what that means for me and what that means for the person that I'm with. So, um, like I said, that's going to spur a conversation, you know what I'm saying, later on in this discussion. But I definitely wanted to make sure I put that out there um, about my experience. Tiff, you're on mute. Oops, I'm sorry, guys. Um, yes, thank you for sharing that. We definitely are going to be talking about that later because um, we are raising children and interracial dating is a thing now. So that's definitely something that we're going to be getting into later. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Mr. J, can you share an experience that you um, had to deal with? Let me see. You're on mute, Jay. I'm on mute, bro. Got you. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I was listening to everybody's story, I was trying to think of which um, story I was going to tell. I didn't realize I had so many <laughs> coming up. I was like, yo, I could tell this. I could tell. But I think the one that was kind of spoke volumes to me as myself, um, not only how I would react, but also just the culture that I was around. I was at the store, there was like this corner store. I grew up in um, Greenville, North Carolina, if you're familiar with that. Um, so we, yeah, you see you. Um, one of the things that we're known for is Pete John's barbecue. Although I don't eat pork, um, the that was like the spot and everybody, that us included would go there. Like we all knew that the grand wizard of the KKK was the owner of that barbecue spot. Oh. So what they would do in the next city over called Aiden is they would always do like these clan rallies and have like these marches and all of that stuff. So one of those weekends, I was at the store at the corner store, running my mouth, talking junk. And I guess two of the clan members had heard me talking junk and um, I was a teenager. I was walking back to my house. I got in the parking lot and these two white guys pulled up to the um, to the road and was like, you know, talking junk, call me a nigga, whatever, whatever. And um, it was always been a hothead. I go into my house 
I didn't have guns. I was still a kid. But I grabbed my bat and, um, you know, he was ready to go ahead and get busy. And uh, my mother wouldn't let me come out the house. And in hindsight, I thought about the rage that I felt for them to even, you know, threaten me in that way. But at the same time, it was rage because I couldn't get to them. But it was also rage because after the fact, my grandfather was like, um, there was this, I guess, fear or this this authority that was instilled in that generation that said that we could, you know, we're supposed to just take racism and and you know you you live instead of fighting. But if you notice every generation we get less fearful of those imaginary lines. So where I was a hothead back then, you know, this generation here, of course, you see the evidence of their lack of fear of racism. But um that was always something that kind of just that was one of the things that I experienced, but I, I experienced racism from police. I've experienced racism from, you know, complete strangers. Um, I've never had anyone physically touch me, but words sometimes spark fire just like they did. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's probably one that stuck out. I did have someone touch me. A cop hit me one time when I was um, handcuffed. And called me wow. a nigga. Yeah, yeah. Wow, these are some serious experiences. Wow. Yeah. Um, growing up that close, having the favorite barbecue spot owned by a KKK uh, member. Wow. All right, Mr. Man, Brandon. Oh, wow. Okay, Mr. Brandon, let's hear it. What was your experience? Brandy, you have to unmute yourself. I'm trying to do it and it's not doing it. There you go. There I you go. Lot, I grew up a lot differently than the than the people that I was raised with. Um, when people were when when the guys were talking about um, racism, I was just trying to think about so many stories like can I go this way can I go that way what can I tell because of the environment I grew up in um my parents raised me in private schools so you know the the people that I grew up with um went to public schools right from Hidden Valley to Dorado well really Hidden Valley um that was my childhood but they went to public schools and I went to private schools and so they really couldn't afford, their parents really couldn't afford um, to be put in private schools. And I know that the the people that I went to school with, right, were predominantly white schools. And their parents would take them out of public schools because they didn't want them to be around black people. Um, so so many uh, incidents, I could tell you sixth grade at Calvary Christian, um, every day there was an incident. Um, Calvary Christian, people from Carolina Christian went to Calvary Christian because Carolina Christian shut down. I don't know if you remember the Jim Baker era, but Jim Baker came in and bought out Carolina Christian. Him and Tammy Faye Baker bought out Carolina Christian and Carolina Christian shut down, so I had to transfer. When I transferred to Calvary Christian, the people that I went to school with at Carolina Christian were predominantly white and they changed up because Calvary Christian only had four blacks in the whole school. So you figure out of a thousand students, there's only four blacks in that school. Uh, um, so all through that, y'all already know I got a loud mouth. And I was all about black, black, black back then because I got it from my daddy. <clears throat> so I saw things that was going on in the classroom. Um, every day, my daddy had to come to school to either come get me 
or talk to the principal because the kids were saying anything they wanted to. You know what I'm saying? Nigga this, nigga that. And, you know, it'll bust into a fight. So I'd be fighting like every day. Mm-hmm. Um, then it got into conferences to where, um, you know, my dad and my mom had to set up parent and teacher conferences every week. Like it was always something going on with me. And it got to a point to where they tried to fail me. Um, And I went to Devonshire. And when I went to Devonshire, I didn't have to go because once they found out curriculum, my curriculum, like how high functioning I was, they told me not to come back because I was on a whole nother level. So systematically, um, you know, white, it's, it's been white supremacy for me growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, it was white supremacy. It was another incident when we moved to Rock Hill from Durham because my daddy had um, his, he got his law degree in Durham and he wanted to further you know, his job career. So we moved to Rock Hill. When we moved to Rock Hill, my neighbors was a police officer on one end and two white teenagers. And every day they pick, you know, I go outside, try to make friends or whatever. And they would pick at me. Now I'm five years old. And one day I'm outside and I'm just playing, 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 you know, just playing by myself. And a rock hits me. And it was the two white teenagers who threw the rocket. You know what I mean? And bust my head. If you look, it's right here. If you look closely, it's right here. And bust my head. Um, and my daddy went and had to talk with him and let him know that he was a lawyer and that he was going to press charges. So it's so many, it's so many different um incidents growing up and being in private school um to where every day I'd be called a nigga. You know what I'm saying? Um you know so that was regular for me. You know what I mean? Um to defend myself for being black and you know being a being voiceful of being black. And you know but now it's like um, me, me looking back at that because I was talking about trauma. Me looking back at that, I see how God restored me. And I see how, you know, those things that I grew up dealing with, because not only I had to deal with that, you got to look at it as a teenager. My mama and daddy had to deal with that more than I did because I was a boy. You know what I'm saying? And you can imagine somebody getting off their jobs every day in order to see what's going on with me, with these people. And see, my daddy didn't play with them. You know what I mean? He already saw that it was racism. You know what I'm saying? So he'd go to the, and he'd call it out, it's flat racism. So when you look at the the, the traumatic side of it, um, I just, as I look back at it now, I see how God has restored me to where um, I'm just over that. You know what I mean? It doesn't affect me like it used to. And, you know, so those are my dealings with racism. They tried to fail me educationally Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't work. You know what I mean? And they tried to scar me mentally. It didn't work. Tried to scar me spiritually. And it didn't work. So, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of our children um, are dealing with racism right now, and that is one of the reasons that we're talking tonight. So, the whole point of me asking everyone to share is so that everyone understands that everyone here on this panel has dealt with racism in one way, shape, or form. Um, I told Cedric the other day that I can't remember me personally experiencing racism and someone said to me, well, you probably experienced and just didn't realize that you were experiencing it. Like, um, I believe, was it 
somebody said that somebody said earlier okay I'm sorry I don't know who it was um but just not knowing that you were experiencing racism um so all of us here are fathers and all of you have had experiences and so I wanted to share something with you very quickly Okay, can y'all see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six kids in this video. That's about the number that's on this panel right now. That could be any one of our kids. How are you talking to your kids about racism right now? And what is it that you are telling your kids right now about racism because all of our kids are seeing this and I, I know they're watching TV. I know they're, they're listening to the radio. So how are you talking to your kids about racism? You know, my dad never really, um, my, my parents period, I had to learn things like sex and racism on my own. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so when I look at, you know, when I talk to the kids about racism or whatever, I talk to them about the character more than I do um, the race. Because one thing that my mama always told me um, is sort of like Martin Luther King, look at the character of a person. Because, you know, just because that one white person treated you bad, that don't mean that, you know, you're supposed to hate all white people. So you just look at that one individual. And so that's what I try to teach my son. Like, don't look at it as, as um, that particular person being a racist, look at his character, if that makes any sense. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. What about you, Mr. JT? I know you have children. What do you yeah. talk to your kids about? Yeah, um, when I'm bringing it up to them, it's, it's first and foremost, always be aware of your environment. And I also pour into them, um, all white people are not bad. A lot of this stuff is deeply rooted. You know what I'm saying? They had to be taught to be racist. They didn't, you know, they just didn't come out the womb like that. So understand what you're dealing with um, when you when you see and you're around different races and, 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 and also, um, be be mindful of how you go about your interactions because realize when somebody is trying to mistreat you and understand when somebody is trying to downgrade you. You know what I'm saying? Be, be Stand up for yourself. You know what I'm saying? Have the attitude that regardless of how you feel about me, I'm still going to move forward, press forward. Regardless of how you, what you call me and how you title me, I say now the one thing that I do tell them is this. If somebody puts your hands on you, it's a different story. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody has the right to do that, period. But always be mindful that we do live in a society that um, is, is, is um, very, very cruel and it's a cold world and we still are not free. Things are just a little bit different but far as being free. And I tell them, I don't sugarcoat it. You know, we as men, especially young black men, and black men in the society already got two strikes against us. And they're waiting for us, you know what I'm saying, to make the wrong move. Um, what I advise them also is this, you make it home. You make it home and then we'll figure out how to make it right. You know what I'm saying? Don't get caught up and, and just always be mindful that um, there's a way to make it home. And you know, once you do, then we take it from there. Yes. What about you, Mr. Dwayne? What are you talking to your kids about when it comes to um, racism? Uh, my conversation is a little bit different because I have uh, five kids and they all range from 24 to four. So each conversation is a little bit different um, based on you know their age, um, uh, where they grew up at or where they went to school at. Um, I have two uh, 20 year olds now and their conversation is going to be a little bit different because one of them drives and one of them doesn't. Um, one goes to a historically black college and one doesn't. Um, 
I have a son that's 21. His conversation is going to be a little bit different than my son that's four. Um, when my son that's four now, uh, his conversation is going to be a lot, uh, a lot more interesting because depending on how everything works out now, from now until he grows up, um, my, uh, my conversations are always about safety and always about being the best that you can. I usually take from, you know, if it, has anybody ever watched Scandal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, on the first season, um, Olivia Pope's father said this one line to her. He said, you have to be as twice as, you have to be as twice as good to get it. You have to be twice as good as them to get half of what they have. So my conversation goes like that. Always be the best that you can. Um, make it home, um, be respectful, um, and let me handle it. I like it. I like it. Um, I, I'm seeing a, a pattern here, but I will talk about that as when we finish with this part of this question. Um, Mr. J, I'm saving you um, for last, Mr. Jarrell, because I have a specific question for you in addition. Um, so Mr. J, um, what are you talking to your kids about when it comes to, um, to racism? Um, I think it's important to not make it necessarily about an ethnic group. I think um, that my kids are still young, so they're still experiencing it on a very childlike, you know, their interaction is very childlike. But what I want to teach them is more so be aware of the system. The system itself is, 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 racist and therefore you know there can be people that's part of that system that look like you that can be racist so i definitely want to um instill that and also i want them to like my like the um the my um fellow panel was saying like you do have to you don't have the option of being as loose with things as as the other um ethnic groups like five over at best, but you know, you're not out here wilding out. You don't have those luxuries of doing burnouts at the light, you know, all of that stuff. Because we already know that system looks for us to be um, not following the laws and not following. You know, they they look for you with your pants sagging. They look for you um, being loud or, or fussing or arguing. In some cases, jaywalking. You know, like, so knowing how the system uses its laws to enforce strictly for one ethnic group, but then, you know, I've gotten jaywalking tickets or, or loitering tickets while people was loitering watching me get my ticket. Right. You know what I mean? And so um, just that, understanding that it's not fair and how do we protect ourselves in that unfair system right right what about yeah. you Cedric what do you um express upon when it comes to your children um well like um me and uh me and C Dwayne we talked uh was it yesterday um and, and we had talked about this um about what age do you start speaking to your kids about racism and what's going on in the world. So we as parents, we prepare our children for the world that we've already experienced. They, we see stuff that they don't see. I can't tell you how many times where we're out with the kids and we might notice something and they it totally miss them, you know, because they might be wrapped up in the YouTube and the TikTok and all of that stuff, whatever. And so, um, uh, you know, me and me and Dwayne, we both agree that, you know, this middle age, uh, 12, 13 years old is probably like the best time to really start talking to them. So with um, with our son, with Devin, um, he's really, you know, intuitive. He's really into the History Channel and stuff like that. So um, I kind of throw things at him uh, as far as, you know, researching his history. You know, yesterday I told him, I was like, do you know what Juneteenth is? And he's like, no. I said, you need to look that up 
and you really need to understand it and, and, and realize what that means to you and to your culture. You know, so the big thing with um, with our kids is and, and, and this was another thing that we talked about, you know, going into the colorism. Um, our kids are light skin, red hair, freckles. OK, so they don't look like your typical black American. So it's a lot of things that they might come into play that I didn't experience or that I did experience. So I have to be a, a little more sensitive for them because, uh, you know, my skin is darker. So they're going to come into situations where it's going to be their own kind. They don't accept them because they too light to be black but then they too black to be white. And so, you know, with, with our daughter, you know, she's, she's kind of expressed, you know, towards the line of interracial dating. Now, obviously we're not doing that dating thing no time soon. She's only 12, but, um, but her expressing that she's into white boys. Um, now that's a whole different conversation that I have to have with her because, um, you know, like I said, I was raised in a household where, you know, we don't see color. But like I said earlier, um, you have to be smart about what you're doing here. And and I don't want to necessarily get in her way, but I have to do what I have to do as a parent to protect my child. So um, it's we just really kind of start getting into these conversations. But um, as, as with everything that's going on in the world, I, I need them to be aware of what's going on when they step outside my house i'm not always there i can't be there you know you know if, if school opens up or or you know if they go to the store so I'm, like, I'm not always there anything that happens outside of my household or whatever so I, I need them to be aware of what's going on so um you know i, I push to them you know you don't necessarily have to watch the videos about what's happened, but they're on YouTube enough to, to hey, watch the news. I need you to know what's going on. I need you to be aware of your surroundings. You know what I mean? So um, so it's, it's, it's early, but that's, that's where I'm at with mine. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mr. Jarrell, um, I would like for you to answer that question as well. And then I'm going to ask you an additional question. So how are you talking to your kids about um, racism right now? So I, I, I have to put it in context before I answer it, because I'm a I'm an old dad. So <laughs> <laughs> my kids, my kids are nine and six. And I was born in 1970s. So my um my perspective as it relates to race is um like they've skipped a couple generations removed from where i am and the way that i grew up is completely different from my girls and so you know my girls don't really have um as it relates to racism i don't think that they have any sort of clue around that that's not um at their ages right now, that's not anything that I'm really ready to put my um, my experiences onto them. I'm like very, very careful and mindful about ensuring that I don't transfer my generational experience to them because they're growing up in a completely different time. Now that time still includes racism and all the other isms, and but when it's appropriate, where I really want to make sure that they have visibility to are things like implicit bias, white privilege, institutional structures and systems that are in place that are designed to keep them in a, in a particular state. And so, um, but I don't, I, I really, this is something that I was talking about recently. We've been kind of dreading, how do I go down? You know, I, I've, I've worked hard so that my girls can be shielded from that and don't have to have that on their mind. Everything, I, if I'm honest to this panel and anybody who's listening, when I have experiences, all of my experiences comes through a lens of race. And I don't think that's a good thing for me. So I, I wanna make that clear, but it's the way I grew up is that it's, I'm a product of my experiences. I'm a product of my, of my environment, but I don't want my girls to grow up 
with that same lens, although I want them to be woke. And like I said, I do want them to understand what implicit bias is and what they're going to experience, what racism is. And then also, um, you know, like I said, the way so the society is structured, where it relegates them not only as black people, but then they have that extra layer of being a woman. And, and so I want them to be completely prepared. Um, we do talk at a high level about historical things because I love history. So uh, with my oldest, we certainly were talking about the Emancipation Proclamation, Juneteenth, um, you know, different, different levels of facts, but that's the way that I'm, I'm trying to, to uh, pour into them at this point, just, just overall knowledge. Yes. Yes, I definitely understand that um, perspective, um, Mr. Jarrell. I probably can say that I was brought up the same way as you're raising your girls. My, my parents, um, we never talked about race. Um, we never talked about racism. I don't ever recall in a conversation with my parents about racism. Um, we did talk about history. We did talk about culture. Um, we did talk about uh, being community servants, um, serving your community, um, you know, growing up and being a biracial, um, uh, having a biracial background and so forth. So um, I was brought up the same way. And I thank my parents for that because I was, as you said, shielded from some things. And I think that that um, gave me a more open mind to a lot of different things culturally. But then as I've gotten older, some people have seen it as a weakness for me. And I'm not saying this would be for your girls, but for me, because I have not been the black power, the this, that, the third. Um, and some people see that as not being right. But for me, um, I've tried to, I've raised my, my twins to not, we don't necessarily talk about racism, but we do talk about race. We do talk about culture. Um, so I, I definitely applaud you for that, for wanting to protect them at, at, with their young minds right now, but also recognizing that, you know, we're, we're in a, a world right now where unfortunately that it's fact. And so as they I get do, older- If I could just say this, I, I would just say that while I just think it's as I'm trying to keep things age appropriate, but I have to be honest, I have every intention of making sure that they clearly understand, you know, I'm, I'm not going to deliver them to the wolves. I mean, they need to clearly understand what this life in this world, what, what it could potentially bring to them. And I do want them to understand, you know, I want them to have a broad perspective. So I don't want it to be a singular view of racism. All right. There are multiple isms that we deal with on a daily basis. And so exactly. they have some extra layers um, being black women that, you know, are going to come with life and, and they need to be properly prepared and equipped. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, we have every intention of doing that. But yes. um, um, and that was my understanding. I'm sorry if it sounded like that's not what I was saying. No, 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 no. But I'm just saying we, we do have to have those discussions. This is what yes. I'm saying. Yes, yes, totally agree. Um, so with you being the, um, you know, on the county commission, what are some things that you feel are important in your position right now when it comes to where we are right now? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, and that's a lot to unpack, but I would just say, generally speaking, as an African-American elected official, I think there's an extra layer of responsibility to ensure that I speak to the societal ills and uh, call it out um, in a way that is um, um, based on my experience, but also to be able to attribute the uh, data and additional perspectives that, that really can point to disparities and how racism provides disparate outcomes for African-Americans and other people of color. So for example, if you look at um, uh, lending institutions, how uh, um, resources for minority-owned businesses, if you look at uh, health outcomes, which we are seeing right now during the pandemic and COVID-19, how 
we're disproportionately uh, impacted because of all the underlying health issues we have because of lack of access uh, to health care. When you look at our educational system, you look at the outcomes that African American children in, in Charlotte Mecklenburg, we have you know 29% of black boys that are reading on grade level. That's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that as an elected official, I have to call out and try to put those mechanisms in place to change those outcomes. Yes, yes, thank you. And we definitely need that and we support you in that. Thank you for sharing um, some of those things that you're gonna be doing in our community. Um, we all talked about a couple of things. One is to make sure that our children are aware. And then also I heard several of you say that just get home safe, just get home safe. And we know that there's a lot of our children, our, our husbands, our fathers who are not making it home safe. So for those of you who have um, teenagers or adult children, what, is, what, is that, what does that mean, get home safe? If your child said, well, how do I get home safe? What does that mean to get home safe? Because what do you do or what does your son do when they get stopped by a police officer? Or what does your daughter do when she's approached by someone on the street? What are, what are some of the suggestions that you're giving your children so that they do get home safe? And anybody can speak. Yes, sir. Mr. Dwayne. I'll go first. Um, what it means to me, there's two things that stand out to me whenever you say that, how to get home safe and you know how do you have a conversation. One thing is code switch. You don't know what code switch is. It is a different way of talking to um, someone of authority. And that could be a teacher, that could be a police officer, um, that could be of anyone. Number two is beware of your surroundings. Um, that's not a color thing, that's not a race thing, that's a safety thing. Um, and I tell all my children, you know, including you know my family, my, my wife as well, be aware of your surroundings, know who you're around, know, know where it looks safe and where it doesn't look safe. Um, get home safe means that you, you need, in times of need, you have to put on company manners. You, sometimes you can be as mad as fire, mm -hmm. but having company manners makes a difference. And that's yeah. why I said, you know, um, get home safe and let me handle it. Yes, yes. Would anybody else like to chime in on what that means when you're, you're talking to your family and your children, when you tell them to get home safe? Well, it's definitely important to do that. I tell my boys, um, you know, the, the 10 and two technique, if you in the stop, is gonna be, you know what I'm saying, your best friend. And then being in, uh, um, making sure that you are following protocol. You know, don't don't get excited, stay calm. Don't show that you sweat, you know what I'm saying? And I tell and I tell my boys, long as you your hands, you know what I'm saying, are on that stand with you, you want honey. And it doesn't guarantee that things are gonna go right, but it's gonna increase those chances. Um, you know, because I've been in those situations and I told them my experiences, I was stopped for, you know, oh, your tent is too dark. I didn't have a 20% uh, tent on my car. Well, nowhere near dark or anything else, but I was being profiled. So based off that experience, I still that in my boys, you know, and no matter what the situation, especially with the police, make it home, you know what I'm saying? Hit the, hit the code that, you know what I'm saying? That you know that we share between us. If we know situation isn't right, you got an opportunity to hit it, you got it off speed down, you got it, technology allows it to have it in Siri too. So we got it under, we got it all the way up under control. If you in trouble, we'll know, I'll know because I'll know what message comes through that phone or I'll know that phone call. If you're able to make it, I understand what it is and I'll act accordingly off of that. Making the home safe is priority and it's the plan. It's like we huddle. And it's like, okay, the play is to make a home safe. But if we have to call it alternate. We already know what to play. We already know what to go to. Right, right. I like that, that, I like that. I like that a lot to, to have something in place that when you feel that you're in a threatening situation or something that you, there's a way that they can communicate that to you. I think that's, that's really important. 
very important. Thank you. Cedric. Um, just to, uh, I guess to add to what the guys were saying about knowing your surroundings and, uh, and this might just be a me thing, um, but uh, this was a one thing that, um, that my mom taught me and it's it tough for her to teach me this, whatever, because, you know, she's not my father or whatever, but just knowing that I have a wife and two kids that I have to protect when we're out in public. They know, and, and, and it's probably annoying to the kids by now, whatever, but my wife know me well enough to know there's two things that I always do. When we're walking on the sidewalk, I'm always on the outside. And I'm pretty sure that all you gentlemen know what that means. I mean, they've showed pictures before on the internet, or whatever, you know what I'm saying, where you see the woman and the man or whatever, but like, you know what that means, you know what I'm saying, as the man, you're protecting your own. You know what I mean? So you got to be on the outside or whatever. So any danger and stuff, you see it first, car come or whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's going to get you first, whatever it can be. But, you know, for the most important is, is when we're in a place, a public place, restaurant, for the most part, I always sit where I can see the exit. And uh, and so, like, like I said, my, you know, Tiffany knows, you know what I'm saying? At this point, you know what I'm saying? She's just used to it. It don't matter if we get a booth. It don't matter where we at. She knows that that one seat where I can see the exit, that is my seat. I don't care if that means I'm sitting beside the kids or I'm sitting beside my wife. It doesn't matter. And so I've been trying to school my son on this same principle. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and everybody didn't have it that same way or whatever. You know what I'm saying? We were blessed with a boy and a girl. So um, for the most part, the conversation is the same for them. But my conversation is a little different for my son because I need him to understand where he is when it comes down to making sure his sister's okay, making sure his mama's okay. So I let him know, this is why I sit in this seat. If a, if a shooter comes in or whatever, I see it first. I'm going to let y'all know what to do. You know, if that means that I got to take the bullet first, I'm going to take the bullet first because I'm going to take care of mine. I'm going to protect my family. So, you know, some stuff that seems so simple uh, uh, to them you know what I'm saying? They might not understand what it really means. So I've been trying to kind of school my son on some of that stuff. Um, you know, and that's just general. That's not necessarily, you know what I'm saying, with racism. That's just in general. So. To be the protector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else like to chime in on that? What does it mean to get home? We can move on. Okay, so. Brandon trying to talk, but I think you're on mute. Oh, okay. Let me see. When I was at Lewisburg, um, Thank you, sir. like it would be like every holiday, my parents would come get me. And one day my daddy came to get me and he was just fussing because he really didn't want to come get me. You know, he wanted me to ride the bus, but I was so spoiled that, you know, I aggravated him so much in order to come get me. So it was one dark, it was dark one night and we was riding back to Charlotte and the police stopped him because he was speeding. And daddy was like, he kept riding because he wanted to be in an open area because he didn't feel safe, you know, being stopped by the cops or whatever. So he wanted to be surrounded. Now they didn't have cameras back then, um, you know, to where, you know, flashing cell phone cameras and stuff like that. But he told the police officer, he was like, you know, I, I had to stop at open exit because I didn't feel safe, you know, basically, um, you know, um, around my son, I really didn't feel safe. I really didn't feel protected. So I had to come in an open area before you stopped me. But the main thing I tell my, tell my kids is the same thing, be an open area, be basically an open area to where people can see you, but at the same time, be obedient. Listen to what the officers are saying, follow directions and don't talk back, don't, don't feed back, don't run your mouth to them or anything, just listen to what they say until they're going about their business. And I think that will eliminate a lot of stuff 
that'll go on because a lot of them are, are basing what they do as far as authority, um, as far as bullying based on their position. And you don't want them to feel that they're more in position than what they are, which means that if they that if they don't if if basically they're more aggressive based off of their position, you don't want them what what's what's the word for it? You don't want them you don't want to give them more um ammunition. You know what I mean? You don't want to you don't want to make them any more angrier than what they are. So I basically tell my kids, you know, just be obedient, listen, and you know, follow directions, and they'll be on their way. Very good, very good. Those are all very, very important suggestions about being aware of your surroundings, being respectful, um, following the directions. Um, you know, just being aware, being woke. Um, understand, understanding and especially with our, our sons as Cedric is teaching our son is how to be the protector of the family. Um, those are a lot of great suggestions that we can share and that we're sharing tonight with other people. And I'm gonna invite other people to share with us on, um, on the thread and in the comments, how are, you know, what is it that you're telling your kids about how to deal with racism, how to deal with the injustices of the world, because injustices are, are real. We're seeing them every day on TV. Someone's getting killed, someone's being shot in the back. There's kids are being held at, at gunpoint. This is an everyday thing that we're seeing on the news right now. So what are some things, because we're gonna start wrapping things up, what are some things that we can do individually or as a community? What are some of your suggestions or what are some things that you personally are doing in the community to, to fight the good fight, to you know try to protect our community, to educate our community? I would say engage with, uh, I would engage with law enforcement, um, you know, as far as like racism, um, address, address racism. You know, that's what I do a lot um, as far as the community. Um, you know, I don't think every police officer, every police officer, officer that's white in a uniform is evil or hateful. Um, some want to feed the family, some love the community, some want to help. And, you know, you have some that's just hateful. Um, how do you separate the hateful from, you know, the ones who, you know, love on the community? Well, you call them to the community mm -hmm. and you get to know them. Um, there's not an officer in this neighborhood that we don't know you know, I don't know us, you know, make friends with them. Um, and that way you'll start to see uh, different signs, you know, whether that police officer is for you or against you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would say, invite them to the community, um, community events, invite them, engage with them, um, talk to them, you know, get familiar with law enforcement. Yes, I totally agree with that. Um, that is something that I have repeatedly said and will continue to say that not all officers are bad um, and not all white people are bad. Um, and I think that it's very important that we include officers and we do include other races in this fight that we're in um, because we, we can't do it by ourselves. We do need a community leaders, um, which is why we invited Mr. Jarrell to be on here with us. We do need a community leaders. We do need a commissioner. We do need people that are in office to join us, whether you're black, white, Asian, whatever your race is, this is, some, this is a, a national effort. Um, and so I definitely agree with you on inviting police officers and um, other, or the majority race to join in this. And there are a lot of, uh, in the majority or ca Caucasians who are supporting 
this yeah. this fight that we're in right now. So thank Very you. For that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, would anybody else like to offer? What are some things that we can do in the community, or what are you doing in the community right now, Mr. Dwayne? Um, I'd like to offer um, this. This panel, I hoped, my hope was that that something would spring forward from this. Um, a mentorship program for the community, um, for um, the youth, um, and not just in any particular area, but just a mentorship program that we can, that any of us can take back to our community and use. Um, and uh, using our community, using our own communities. Um, one of the things I think that, you know, we should do, and I'm glad that we do have a, an elected official um, here with us, is be an elected official or reach out to your elected official because the only way that you're going to be able to change is changing policy. Uh, changing policies, changing laws. Um, I heard uh, one of the panel members talk, talk about how the system is, uh, how the system is, that racism isn't, um, racism is there, but the system is racist. And that could be somebody, like someone said, that could be somebody that looks just like us. Mm -hmm. so in, order to change, in order to change the system, we have to be either in commun communication with the politicians or become a politician um, ourselves. Um, I think that that is one of the best ways to affect change and also get change done. Um, I know me and you, Tiffany, we work together in domestic violence. Um, and, you know, this, uh, this panel is a good idea and it blends two things that's together that we know is true, that we know that the system is broken because we both uh, deal with law enforcement. Uh, working in domestic violence, we deal on law enforcement. And you know, just the topics that we're talking about here, we deal on law enforcement. And if you are someone that is a, a, a victim of abuse, you know that the system can be, um, can abuse you also um, with, prosecutors not prosecuting the law or your abuser abusing you. And I think that, you know, that's, that's where I want to marry the two, the two uh, uh, thoughts together. Yes, yes, thank you for including that. Um, the system can change and it has to change, but the only way that it can change is if we have the people in place to help with making those changes happen. Um, and so that means that we need to be out voting or advocating or, or offering up suggestions to those that can make the changes. Um, so definitely agree with you to, to have these partnerships with our, with our leaders, those that have been elected with, um, you know, government officials, with the police officers, with, with our commissioners. So um, thank you. Thank you for adding that. Let me add, um, I want to just leave it saying be the change that you seek. And that, that sits with me so heavy. Um, me and Tiffany were in Wilmington this past weekend and we witnessed a protest and they were out there on the um, city hall steps every day, the entire time we was out there, rain, whatever, they was out there in the tent. And um, the lady, the young lady that was leading the group, um, she said that they've been out there for several weeks, same day, same times, I think it's like five to nine every day. And she said that, um, I mean, she said the same thing that I just said, being the, the change that you see. But she said, literally, they were a small group that just wanted to protest and they wanted to, uh, to, to stand up for what was right. And it reached the right people, you know, and eventually it grew into something so much more. Now, this same group that's been out there protesting is on the verge of becoming a nonprofit and they're about to get their own building. So not only are they um, protesting, but they're also trying to teach and, and, and get people educated on what's going on and how you can make changes uh, to see the change that you see. Um, and so uh, when me and Tiffany was there, it was it was very, very powerful. Um, I want to say that, that one day we was there, there's probably about uh, 50, 60 people and, um, and, and they, everybody had signs um, and the community 
was supporting them as people would see them random people would bring food for the people that's out there protesting from five to nine uh somebody brought waters they had their own signs when people drove by they honked their horns they put their fists in the air and um and it was like i said it was just very moving because that that wasn't the initial goal but it became so much more than what they initially planned and so uh, that was just very exciting to see yes it definitely was that was the first time i'd ever been involved in anything like that um made me a little nervous but I was also very proud to be a part of it. Um, it was not a uh, hostile environment. It was not violent. Um, it was very calm. Everybody was very supportive. It was very loving. Um, it, when I hear protest, I immediately think something aggressive, but it was not aggressive at all. Um, and I definitely want to shout them out, Miss Lily Nicole. Um, she is one of the founders of the Lower Case Leaders in Wilmington, North Carolina. We will be interviewing her, I believe, on July 10th. So please tune in for that so you can see what this amazing group that started off as just some friends getting together that is now turning into a 501c3. So those are the kind of things that we can do. Those are the kind of changes that we can make um, is by forming these organizations to, to, to make the change that we seek. Um, and they're also starting a youth organization or uh, they are also going to be having a mentorship or youth, um, uh, I guess, committee or, you know, involvement in the lowercase leaders, um, leaders so that they can um, talk to children, um, young and old, about racism, about social injustice and what they can do in the community as well and getting them involved in a safe environment. So, yes, thank you um, for sharing that with us. Can I add something to that? Yes, please add something to that. Okay. So I have a different um, understanding of what would be my, this is my, you know, speaking completely from myself. So I don't think at this stage of our building that we need to add police involvement in our restructuring of our community. Um, I think that it is needed. Um, Mr. Brown had a point. I think it is needed. I think everybody has their role to play. That definitely would be my role to play. I would mess that all, all the pieces. Um, but I think that those people that are able to have those conversations should have those conversations. But I think we in our community need to have conversations with ourselves and um, police ourselves. And, and I don't think um, outside police forces should be the end all be all because you know I remember in our neighborhoods back when you know when somebody did something crazy. It was the grandmothers and the mothers that would get to you. They didn't have to call the cops if, if one child acted up. You know, the whole, the, the mothers would get you if the fathers didn't get you. So um, I think we need to go back to that system. Um, I think that dialogue that we should have in our community is our dialogue. And then when we bring them in, you ain't got a whole bunch of angry voices and no real structure, no foundation, no real demands that's realistic. You know what I mean? But um, yeah. I, I, me, myself, being active, using the tools that I have from a music aspect, you know, music controls the culture. Mm -hmm. So um, being able to, to teach and educate from that aspect, also being in the community, um, speaking against police brutality, speaking against um, even the gang violence, you know, um, to be able to sit down with different gang members and have that conversation. That's more valuable to me than um, sitting at a church having conversation with police because the police go home. The gang members, they, they home is in our community. So I would much rather have those conversations and, and, and build from that angle. And yeah. um, kind of does a, a two-in-one because if you decrease crime in the community by creating peace in the community, there's less, there's less police presence, Yeah, you know? Yes, 
That's a very good point. And I definitely respect that. And a lot of people share the same your same feeling that, you know, let's 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 build the community up, make the build the community strong, build the village back up, and then we can have those conversations with with you know, the officers and the churches and so forth. Let's let's start here first and build up from there. So I I definitely respect that. I definitely respect that. And a lot of people share share that feeling, and myself included, I definitely respect that opinion as well. Mr. Durrell, tell us how can we as community help our community? What would you like to see citizens of the community do that can help you, you know, elected officials make the community better? Yeah, another another great question, Tiffany. And um, I, I, so there's a couple things that I would speak to. Um, the first thing I would speak to is, um, well, I, I wanna go back to something that you said earlier. It, you know, I, I think it is, in, and I, I've talked about systems a lot and systemic racism and the institutionalized racism tonight, um, because I think it's really, really important that we understand that just because people are not calling you the N-word on a daily basis or, you know, you, you're, you're still dealing with a, a system that was designed to um, produce an outcome that where you're not supposed to be dealing with uh, on the domestic violence space um, in, in your capacity, Dwayne, right? And, and in Tiffany's capacity, you know, you're supposed to be on the other side of that table. But you've overcome that. And so as we look at these things that um, the way this is set up, it's incumbent upon us that we make sure that we educate ourselves. Um, we can't really, uh, rely as much on opinion or supposition or feelings. Um, we have to really be able to point to data to show how these outcomes, how racism really impacts our outcomes. And so as you wanna uh, engage in your community, one, you have to educate yourself and also really understand that um, politicians, which I hate that word um, because I consider myself a public servant, um, politicians or public servants don't have the power. People, ha the people have the power. I'm a representative of the people. And so um, I can't do anything without the people. And so the people have to realize that they have the power. So whatever changes that you want in your community, you mm. do make sure that your elected officials are listening. Um, but there are some real things that we can do such as plugging into an organization. We don't even have to start a brand new organization. Most of the time, things that people have a passion for, somebody has already built it ready for you to come and plug in to help them grow, you know, grow that organization or lend your time and talent to and, and build that way. I mean, I think in our community here in Mecklenburg County, we, we're not short of programs and nonprofits and people doing different things. I, I think um, it would be nice to see people come together and, and combine resources so that they could scale and have an even greater impact. But I, you know, the, the things that I would say is one, to educate, we have to change our mentality and understand that the people really have the power. That's where the power resides. Yeah. Um, ourselves around the systems and really trying to come together and, and have a definitive goal as we move forward. If you're going to lead people, they need to understand where you're leading them to. Um, a bunch of opinions and a bunch of, of things that you can't back up uh, based on data does not allow you to get past the, the, the door of the room that you're trying to get into. Mm. Finally, do get into that room. You need to be able to speak in a way that people understand and they can hear you. And so when, when you talk about outcomes, when you talk about the systemic nature of all of the institutions that we have, it's very hard to refute those facts because the data is there and it can't be interpreted. It, it, it's really only one way that it can be interpreted. And so I think we just have to be, you know, expand our thought process around the things that, that we're trying to do and trying to create, but plug in, engage in your community, 
And most of all, the easiest thing for us to do is to go vote. It's the easiest thing. If, if, if we don't do, I'll tell you this and I'll be quiet. Black folks, for the most part, we are on the wrong end of every quality of life indicator that there is. Well, for almost everyone, we're on the wrong end. Um, and that is just because of our history and again, the systemic racism that we've had to deal with for 400 years. But there's one thing that we could do that we could lead the way easily, easily, and that's to go vote even with the barriers that they try to put in place. But that's one place where we should encourage everyone to get out there and cast your ballot and let your voice be heard and do it collectively. You want to talk about organizing? Organize a party to the polls. Organize 50, 60 people to watch the polls. Guarantee your elected official is going to notice you and want to speak to you and want to know who you are. If, if they see 50, 60 people marching behind you going to, going to the polls. Guaranteed. So thank you, Tiffany. I, yes, <laughs> I know that um, Mr. Charles Robinson, who's very active in the community, I know that he has um, rallied up. I've been seeing him throughout the years, getting people to go and vote as a group. Um, definitely make an impression when you come with your village to go vote. I. I believe in the power of numbers. Um, I also know that Miss um, Miss Judith Brandon's wife has also been a big advocate for um, us getting out and being a part of the census. So again, making change with numbers and um, taking people as a group to go and vote and to make those changes. Yes, thank you so much for adding that. Um, but also, I like the fact that you talked about unity and how there are so many organizations in the community, even right here on this panel, we had, what about nine different organizations right here on this panel um, that are doing great things in the community who are wanting to make change. Um, we do it sometimes individually, sometimes we do it collectively, but coming together and being united um, and helping each other. That's one thing that um, I've, I've heard throughout my life, and I'm sure other people have heard that, is that us as a race or as African-Americans, a lot of times we have a problem with uniting and coming together and doing things together. Um, and so I really, really appreciate you bringing that to the forefront that we really do. We need to band, band together and not when someone's killed or not when something happens where now everybody's in uproar. We have to do it consistently in order to make change. So I really, really, really appreciate you bringing out that point. Um, and we do have a strong panel here. We're all business owners. We're all African-American. We all are parents. We all want to see change in the community, which is the reason why we are doing this, this panel, why we did this panel tonight. And we'll continue to get together um, on different forums. So I want to say thank you to everyone. We have run over by 20 minutes, but a very good 20 minutes that we have gone over just sharing ideas, sharing suggestions on how we can keep our children safe, how we can keep our family safe, how we can help our communities, what we can do and what we can say to our children and to our families and even those that are listening right now. I hope that we said some things that um, resonated with you that you can share with your families and that maybe you can listen to this together, but also getting you to think of ways that you can be a part of the change in the community that needs to happen because we are a village, we are a family, we are a community. And right now our community is in crisis. Um, we, we have to do it together. Um, we have to get out there and vote. We have to band together. We have to unite. Um, we have to continue having these conversations and doing this together, we can make the change that needs to take place. And I know that we are going to be able to do that if we do it together. So thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight. I wanna, is there anyone else who would like to say something before we close out for the night? Well, I'd just like to, I'd just like to thank you for um, having this panel because I think that we as black men, we need to be open 
and transparent a lot more and, you know, talk about issues like this as a whole. Um, and you've opened up that door in order for more panel discussions, more opportunities for us to come together as Black men and, 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 and form a conversation to address things like systematic racism. Um, and I think once we talk about it more openly, um, the more things will change. So, you know, we thank you all together. We just thank you for this uh, panel that you brought upon us. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you joining us. You, you've always been a great partner in the community. I, I appreciate all of you taking the time out to come on tonight, even though we ran over. Um, I do know that we lost a couple of people because of other commitments, but I want to thank everybody who was on the panel tonight. One thing that I was not able to get on that I wanted to as a woman talking to men is, um, you know, how can us as, as women, as, as, as wives, um, as a mother of your children, how can we help you in the community do what you need to do and what you want to do to help our, to help our boys and to help our men in the community. So that might be another panel. <laughs> well, so. I mean, that's, that's just, um, that's just keep encouraging. That's, that's simple. You know, keep encouraging. Oh, you're doing a good job. I'm proud of you. You know, just say some encouraging words. And the more that we see that as husbands, the more energy we'll have towards what we're trying to do. Yes, make sure that he has what he needs to start out his day in a positive way. Thank you. I remember you sharing about the coffee and how Ms. Judy, make sure that you have your coffee every morning and that that gets your day started in a positive manner. So yes, thank you. Thank you for, for letting me get that, that question in and answering that for me. So yeah. guys, thank you so much. I appreciate you. All of you are kings in your own right. Thank you, Mr. Jarrell, for taking the time to, to, to meet with us today, um, especially at last minute. And I hope that you will join us um, in future endeavors and future panels. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everyone have a good night. And if you um, listen tonight, thank you for listening. Thank you for chiming in. But please, please share this panel tonight with your family, your friends, on your social media, um, because this is a conversation that needed to take place. And it's not just taking place here, it's taking place all over the world. But we're glad that you, you were here with us tonight. Have a great night, everybody. All right, good night. Oh, good.